It's fine. All right. No problem. Thank you. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, we now have a sort of repeat of the pattern that we've had before the break. Um, so that we'll, we'll start with two contributions, this time from Sarai Nayak from the UK and one from Johanna Skoronsk, I'm sorry, Johanna Skowronska from Poland. Uh, and Soraya is a senior lecturer in social work at the University of Salford in the UK, works as a psychoanalytic therapist and supervisor. She's training with Group Analysis North, part of the Institute of Group Analysis in the UK. As an anti-colonial feminist activist, Soraya's principles of collective and group working are the foundations for her psychosocial activism for social justice. For the past four decades, Soraya has worked nationally and internationally to end violence against women and girls and for the liberation of asylum seekers and refugees. Soraya applies models of education as liberation based on the activism of black feminism to raise consciousness about the psychosocial and political impact of oppressive social constructions. So Soraya, I'll <laughs> mute my microphone and um, mute it too and hand over to you and you'll want to share your screen. Thank you, thank you, Lindy. I'll just share my screen now. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. <clears throat> the focus of my response is racialized misogyny. My main spotlights are, misogyny is always intersectional. We are all implicated in racialized misogyny. Do not assume that group analysis is fit for purpose in racialized misogyny. And we need a hospitality between established group analysis and outsider analysis. My focus on the interdependency of racism and misogyny takes up the intersectional imperative threaded through Soon Einhorn's 44th Fuchs lecture and her question of how unconscious patriarchal formulations of group analytic theory erases or disavows what misogyny does to women. As an Irish Indi Indian queer woman of colour, working within groups of women of colour, Einhorn's spotlight takes on particular complexity. We cannot separate racism from misogyny. The intersectional experience of racial misogyny is greater than the sum of racism and sexism. <laughs> Book's basic law of group dynamics that there is no clear frontier between inside and outside takes on particular complexity when translated into racist, misogynist social structures create racist, misogynist psychic structures. The group analytic maxim is that the social penetrates to the core. So the inevitable tension is, how do we practice and understand group analysis through our racist, misogynist psyches? Group analytic practice depends on the extent to which we enable awareness of how the unconscious mind is constantly scanning the external world, seeking out events and situations which can be used to represent our internal situations. How do we attempt this as implicated reproducers 
of racist misogyny. These questions spotlight commitment to the political nature of group analysis. Racialized misogyny spots, spotlights the political of group analysis. Racialized misogyny spotlights intersectionality. Racialized misogyny spotlights commitment as a sustained action to counter our individual and collective complicity with racist patriarchy. It's more than a hypervigilance of recognition. The ideas, language, clinical practice, organizational structures of international institutes of group analysis have and are evolving in a social unconscious where the public persona of black women is shaped by archetypal fetishes of mammies, sapphires, Jezebels, and welfare queens. And archetypal fetishes of Asian women as dragon lady, lotus blossom, and china doll, perpetuated by sellout performances of Madame Butterfly. This year, on the 17th of March, 2021, the shooting of six Asian women in Atlanta was performative of the archetype of Susie Wong, the prostitute with a heart of gold. What does this mean for black and Asian women group conductors? How does the splitting between good, bad, hypersexualized, asexualized, soiled, pure, heart, mind, and East and West manifest in group analytic relational and structural dynamics? What tools does group analysis have to disrupt established essentialist constructions of gender and sexuality and embrace indeterminate and outsider positions of trans women, non-binary and queer women of colour? These questions are pivotal to how we experience mothers, desire, sexuality, potency, aggression, and love, all of which are fundamental to group analysis and none of which are homogeneous. My feminist activist practice to end violence against women and my training in group analysis has taught me the necessity of moving from speaking in generalities to naming the specificity of conscious and unconscious experience. Moving from generalities to specificity is fundamental to the transformation of silence into language and action. I propose that group analytic concepts such as projective identification, counter transference and resonance must always, for it is always present, enable a naming of the nameless dread of racialized misogyny. The challenges of using group analytic concepts implicit in racist misogyny to enable a reparative naming of racist misogyny. Navigating the aporia of insider, outsider positions is what we do in group analysis. What I'm doing here is naming the task in terms of racialized misogyny. Let's take the psychoanalytic ideas of splitting 
and part object relations. And think of these in the context of wounds, breasts, vaginas, an objectification of bodies, whilst holding in mind that part of this objectification is the invisibility and silence about women and non-binary queer and trans women because they do not have wounds, breasts and vaginas. Part object, objectification of racialized wounds takes on a particular sharpness in the context of the mass forced sterilization of wounds of black, Asian, Latino, indigenous Romani women, including the current sterilization of Muslim Uyghur women in Xinjiang. The part object relation takes on a particular sharpness in the context of racialized breast, ironed flat, racialized clitorises and labia cut off, and racialized vaginas sewn up, leaving a small hole for urine and menstrual blood. And I could add the misogynist practices of forced marriage, child marriage, dowry violence, and menstruation ostracization. These experiences are in the matrix of groups I conduct with women of color. And I, we, need rigorous holding here. The idea of identification between mother and daughter takes on particular sharpness in the context of a brown queer baby born from a white racist heteronormative uterus suckling a white racist heteronormative breast. 30s of the body are intersectional. Did bad mean black? The endless scrubbing with lemon juice in the cracks and crevices of my ripening, darkening body. And oh, the sins of my dark elbows and knees, my gums and nipples, the folds of my neck, and the cave of my armpits. Are psychoanalytic ideas of somatization and body fit for purpose in racialized misogyny? How would group analysis enable a reparative, liberatory deconstruction of the intersectionality of women's relationship to self and others? On a broad level, the query is about who and what are included in the practice theory and organisational structures of group analysis. How is group analysis responding to the ever-changing social and demographic landscape? For example, in the areas of the northwest of England, where I live and work, international migration is the major influence on population growth, with 25% of the increase due to forced migration of asylum seekers. A context where issues of racialized misogyny are both the cause and consequence of forced displacement. I propose that group analysis with women asylum seekers and with women intergenerationally forged in colonialism and slavery demonstrates that we cannot assume group analysis is fit for purpose in racialized misogyny. I propose that a spotlight on intersectional racialized misogyny exposes the urgency for socioeconomic heart and mind hospitality between established group analysis and outsider analysis. I call for an unconditional hospitality to outsider intelligence of anti-colonial, black feminist, critical race and queer knowledge. 
in terms of the critical chorus and cage of emotions within group analysis generally, and in the context of intersectional racist misogyny specifically, I leave you with the words of Audre Lorde. This territory between us feels new and frightening, as well as urgent, rigged with detonating pieces of our individual racial histories, which neither of us choose, but which each of us bear the scars from. Thank you very much. Thank you, Soraya. Brought yet another perspective into our day today. I'm going to move straight on to Joanna. Uh, Joanna is a training group analyst, supervisor and teacher at the Institute of Group Analysis in Warsaw. She runs small analytic groups in private practice and staff support groups for health institutions, as well as providing psychotherapy for individuals and families. She is interested in factors shaping relationships in groups, in group analytic psychotherapy, okay. and in the applicability of groups in different contexts. She's published on this both in Polish and in English. So thank you, Joanna, I'll hand over to you and let you share. Is it okay? Do you hear me now? I was, I'm still- we can, we can hear you, Joanna, but we can't see your text, just that you shared the screen. Yes, that, I, oh, that's- Did you, that's did you choose the, yeah. Yes, I have just did what is necessary to show you my text. Is it okay now? Do you see my text? It's a, blank piece of paper I think no it's the whiteboard the whiteboard oh that's, yeah that's true Thank you. because I see my text it's ah so so probably I cannot share the screen with you it's something wrong I don't know why okay don't worry we we'll see success Yes, it's Excellent. there. Great, finally, I get it. Okay. Thank you very much, Sue, for inviting me to prepare this contribution. It made me rethink my relationship with other women as a daughter, mother, friend, and therapist. To this last aspect of my womanhood, I am going to refer in this presentation. It is kind of clinical vignette. When I read your material, I saw that I had received such a good thing from you women's psychology, and I wanted to check it out immediately in my clinical work. A situation with a patient came to my mind as it puzzled me and I was never entirely satisfied with how I understood her. Moreover, this therapy took place at a crucial time for women in my country, autumn 2020. Since the constitutional court ruling that introduces a near total ban on abortion in Poland, Hundreds of thousands of people have taken to the street. Many women, including me, have experienced this act introduced in time of the pandemic as a slap against their dignity, ability to discern right and wrong, free will, and a threat to their life. The main slogan were, get the fuck out, and you will never walk alone. I decided to rethink this event of a patient with your model. As uh, this reflection is mainly concerned with my experiences as a therapist, I will start from my context. Mother and daughter, the social context. When I was a girl in the uh, 1960s, my father sang or whistled while driving the car. One of the songs in his repertoire sounded like that. A till is not a bird, a girl is not a person, but she rides on a tractor and plows, so she is a person after all. This stanza comes from 1950s romantic comedy, a love story between a bricklayer working on the reconstruction of Warsaw and a singer from the state-run folk ensemble. My mother told me that this tractor was stupid, as was the belief that women are inferior. 
mistake that insufficiently educated people committed in the past. Women don't ride tractors anymore because science has proven that it is detrimental to their future maternity, she told me. When I was listening to my father, I skipped the tractor and heard that he respects me because I can work. And my future maternity is so essential that it is of interest of science and is protected by the state. I believe that the knowledge and science would guarantee a promising future for all of us and that human equality was scientifically proven. My parents shared their work at home fairly, meaning that my father got me ready for school in the morning, made breakfast and braided my hair because his commute was shorter than, than my mother's. They both worked professionally with my mother, achieving a higher professional position and earning more. So one can say that in 60s, I live in a world about which bell hooks wrote only in 2000. Imagine living in a world where there is no domination, but where is a vision of mutuality is the ethos shaping our interactions. Of course, it was a fairy tale for children, not specifically for me, but for children inside my parents who robbed for jail childhood by the war, eagerly believed in the great future promised by the new state. It was only years later when I was completely grew up that I realized that when they argued, they both expressed deep resentment that neither of them was following traditional gender roles. My calm and withdrawn father would get mad at times and condemn my mother for not submitting to him. And she would complain that he was not providing his family sufficiently. This underhand duality permitted the whole of society. Many women who are equally involved in the opposition activities, which in 80, 1980s led to, to changes in social political system, awakened betrayed by their brothers in arm. Uh, when in 1993 and six, the previous liberal abortion law, law was changed. So therapies and patient. The patient was an active participant in the protest and talked with me about her sisterhood experiences with women in the streets. She struggled, struggled to find her voice and feel empowered as she tried to advance her professional career. During the session, she talked about how difficult it is for her to remember her ideas, how she forgets her plans and constantly engages in serving others. Unexpectedly, she began to talk bitterly about her husband was terrorizing the family again because he was simply in a bad mood. This relation improved a big deal, so I was surprised when this returned. Why this returned? She looked at me, her face turned furious and exclaimed, well, no, that's enough, fucking enough, enough. She jumped out of her chair and ran out, slamming the door goodbye so that the lock shattered to pieces. I was surprised and confused what had happened between us. She came to the next meeting a bit embarrassed, but also excited. She apologized for her behavior and said that she felt empowered when driving home and still felt that strength. When I asked her to remember when she felt this anger, she sobbed and said that she was talking to me about her husband and I was smiling indulgently under my breath. I wasn't aware of that smile. Maybe I wasn't even smiling at all, but I was aware of what, was I, uh, what I was thinking. Why this bride gifted a strong woman focusing on this guy again? Why doesn't she leave him alone until he, until he composes himself and can behave decently? The patient associated this smile with her stepfather's smile when she showed dissatisfaction, with her, uh, which meant that she would have to submit anyway. I realized that I let my patient down. I did not help her to understand why, when she talks about her ambitions, this interject appears in the form of her husband's bad mood, nor did I think who she need me to be for her at that moment. Thanks to Sus model, I understood that, what, that without situating this moment, when the patient's capacity for mentalizing her state broke down, Within the total situation of patriarchal society, I could not comprehend that interrelationship between the patient and me. So I understood that my patient trying to convey to me 
and make sense of not fully formulated feeling associated with her struggle to create a room of one's own, an inner uh, external space for herself and her creativity while living in the patriarchal world, a world when you are taught uh, to meet your needs through giving to others and being what others need you to be. I did not recognize this need for support because, as I mentioned, earlier I grew up in a fake world when people are equal. So, uh, my patient needed to see in my eyes the image of a person who can use her aggression in the service of her needs, in her defense or a fight, and not someone who is supposed to endure. Instead, I defensively joined a crucial, a critical horus assessing her why it does and so on. In this way, I enclose myself in the secret catch of emotions to protect myself from the anger against the same oppression which I couldn't be or and be aware of, since it is difficult for women to show and share anger like an other lot taught us. In so doing, I push her into her own cage of emotions, mentally grooming her to be female. Don't object, leave him alone, do your job. This is the lesson my mother taught me. I almost see, see her shrugging her shoulders and doing her own things, driving my father crazy. The patient needed me to help her get the fuck out in her mind, but instead she met my mind identified with the aggressor, inferentially understanding of this phenomenon. Thanks to the energy and mirroring of anger in her sisterly relationship on the streets, she finally got her voice. However, when she came back to me, her anger was redirected to her stepfather, by the way, a not harmful man himself, redirected from me, from the mother and other women in general channel transmission who did not support her in her wish to have a whole life of Zofia, Zofia Naukowska, Polish feminist demanded for women in her time. As therapy is the art of repairing ruptures, this particular alternative finally went well, but I wish so, I had had your model at that time. This model allows women therapists when working with women patients to be aware of the possibility of superimposed worlds. Uh, the term used by Janine Paget to describe the situation when the therapist and, and patient are immersed in the same anxieties and preoccupation arising from context of their daily lives. In such cases, analysts probably do not have the psychic distance and time to establish the analytic relations, as it happened in my case. Moreover, it allows us to understand dependency concentration on others, not as an individual personality traits of women patients, but as adaptation to specific con social context so belonging to NOS and not to the ego, as Tom or Ormai would say. This is not only changes the line of psychotherapy, but prompts to question the same, same fundaments on which psychotherapy is based. The, in contemporary culture, values such as separation, autonomy, and personal development have priority over affiliation, care, and concern for others. So women are expected to be empathic, devoted to others, only to be blamed not for not being autonomous, separated enough, and self-fulfilling, which are traits attributed nowadays to mental health. I am curious how often I and other women therapists with their women patients went through the same wrinkle of mental states described by Sue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joanna. I can see a lot of clapping. Uh, we've had a very rich supply today uh, of talks of new thoughts and ideas, which we will need to take with us into our uh, reflect reflective groups now. 